Yo, what up, YouTube? So today we're going to be talking about the Committee on Public Information. This was a propaganda arm of the United States government that existed from April 13th, 1917, and it dissolved August 21st, 1919. This is a propaganda arm of the United States government that was formed to convince average people that we should be fighting in World War I. And just so you know, this was not some kind of um, secret, secret thing that the government did. When this first came into being, the government actually passed an executive order and it was on the front page of the New York Times. So this was not secretive. This is all out in the open. And a lot has been extensively written about this. Yet I feel that a lot of people and including myself as of recently, still have no idea how the government did this, why they did this, and how it's a precursor and really foreshadowed how the government would behave in the future. So let's take a look at this. So um, first, I got to set the background for you guys. So this first started in 1917, and Woodrow Wilson was our president at the time. And the thing you need to keep in mind was that the huge important thing that I think does not get talked about when we talk about the Committee on Public Information is that England and France had borrowed billions. And I think if you convert it in today's dollars, it would be trillions from the United States in order to wage war against the Germans and the Axis powers in World War I. And it's extremely important that England and France and the Allied powers that we lent all the money to, it's extremely important that they win the war. Because if they lose, it's very likely that the bankers, and the powerful people in the United States won't get paid back the billions that they lent. So before we talk about anything, it's really important to understand that aspect of it, that this was based off of the 1%. This is based off of the oligarchy. This is based off of the needs of the establishment. That is the center for where we're coming from on this. And just so you know, Americans were against fighting overseas, and, and uh, Woodrow Wilson actually won re-election in 1916 with the official campaign slogan, he kept us out of war. So Wilson realized he had to make sure England and France were going to win this war, but at the same time, there was a conflict because the public did not want to get involved, and he even won the previous election on that stance of not getting involved so he knows he has a real problem on his hands another thing i want to point out is that he has been contemplating for a very long time about starting something like this and uh when he does start it he does it by way of executive order so no nothing like this would be passed through the legislative branch this is just a strike of a pen by one man the president of the united states and he signed this executive order eight days after the United States entered World War I. So we'll get back to that. And one more thing, just to set up the background of this, I do want you to know that Congress also passed the Espionage Act and the Sedition Act shortly after. So the Sedition Act, um, also just a little background on that. John Adams, the second president of the United States, also signed a Sedition Act, which is considered the worst piece of legislation to ever come out of Congress, even hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later that we're in now. So the Sedition Act, basically, uh, it's punishable by law to talk disparagingly about your country or about the military or even just about uh, the Allied powers in World War I. And the Espionage Act is just sort of like the, the Sedition Act, only instead of regulating your speech, 
it regulates your actions. So you can't act in a way that's disparaging to the Congress or the military or the United States government. So it's just important to know that shortly after the Committee on Public Information came to be, there's also this silencing of any dissenters to World War I. And remember too, you had important people like Leon Trotsky was actually in New York in 1917. And he only did spend six months of his whole life in America. And those six months were the six months leading up to World War I, where he and a lot of people on the left felt that, you know, the United States is just sending their young boys to go fight a war for the bankers. And that's exactly, that's exactly what World War I was. So now let's talk about, now that we kind of have the background for why it came to be, let's talk about what the Committee on Public Information actually did. Because it sounds so sweet and innocent. It's, it's not a propaganda arm. It's just the Committee on Public Information. So let's see what they did. It starts out they have what's called Four Minutemen. And basically what happened was back then, so there were silent films. And I guess, as I understand it, the whole film and a movie theater wasn't on one reel like it is today. So I guess that uh, in the middle of a movie, when the reel was done with its film, they would stop and it would take four minutes to replace the film. So during that four minutes, there would be volunteers that would speak on behalf of the Committee on Public Information. And they would just be convincing people to buy war bonds, to support the war, and to support the war effort. They had over 75,000 volunteers who gave over 7.5 million speeches. So just understand, there was no great ways to advertise to people. It wasn't like you could shoot them a commercial over the radio or the TV. or it was, There was no great way. Like today, there's all these different ways for companies to shove commercials and advertising in your face. But back in 1917, it wasn't that easy for companies to do that. So maybe today we might think of volunteers speaking at a movie theater as being not very effective. But I do want to point out that during World War I in 1917, this was extremely effective at convincing people. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more. Another thing I want to point out is that so the, the CPI had 279 artists as well as 39 cartoonists on payroll. And they created over 700 different types of posters to be printed as well as 1,438 visual works altogether. So not only did they have volunteers speaking in movie theaters, they also had all these artists creating all these kinds of posters to put around everywhere. And actually, if you look, this is an example on this slide. This is an actual example of one of the of one of the posters they would make. And it says, beat back the Hun with Liberty Bonds. So look how it portrays the Axis powers over here. They're these big, scary, bloodthirsty guys that we need to beat back. So make sure you buy a Liberty Bond. So you can see this is already kind of how they propagated people back then, and it's kind of how they propagate people now. Your enemy is big, and and he's mean, and he's trying to kill you. So make sure, you, make sure you allow the government to spend a ton of money on this on this war, which is what these posters were doing back then. And then another thing I want to point out is that the Committee on Public Information published 75 million pamphlets. And they also created a newspaper that had 115,000 subscriptions. So not only did they have volunteers talking to you, not only did they have artists drawing up posters and things, but they had writers writing and publishing pamphlets. So they were hitting people from all their senses. And, and if they couldn't reach you one way, they were going to go ahead and reach you another way. So, so... This was a very powerful and far-reaching thing. This wasn't a, 
this wasn't a drop in the bucket. This was very large scale operation, 75 million pamphlets. So the conclusion, this is what they did, but how did it turn out? So the results were a little mixed. Leaders of the CPI took pride in the fact that by the time Wilson called to draft the 18 year old men to go fight in the war, the leaders of the CPI were proud that there weren't really any riots or protests compared to what had happened in the Civil War. So just know, because I feel like in my head, I, I never really knew that there were that many protests or riots, riots for the Civil War draft. But apparently there were, and apparently no matter what time period you're living in, People don't really like to be drafted to go fight a war for a bunch of bankers who are collecting interest. So that was very noticeable to me that 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 didn't seem to really bother people. And let's also not forget that half of the adult population in America ended up buying a war bond. So they actually put their money where their mouth was. But also, as you can see on the other side of the equation... Uh, Americans weren't fully convinced because remember that they, they were isolationists then and they did remain isolationists for a very long time even after the CPI was dissolved. And let's remember that Republicans had no problem dismantling the CPI in 1999 or 1919 after World War One was over. So once the war was over, it was easy to dismantle something like this. Another thing, so while we're looking at conclusions, something I do want to point out is that the German Nazi party actually copied a lot of the tactics that Wilson had used 20 years earlier. So I think maybe there's this tendency to say, oh, well, you know, World War One was good and that, you know, it was probably a good idea to get into that war. And really, the Committee on Public Information was just convincing us to do a good thing. So what is really so bad about that? But when you look at if a German Nazi party uses the same tactics and techniques to propagate and trick people and change people's view on the world, then, then shouldn't we be talking about the evil of the government having the power to change how we see things in the world, regardless of if we agree that we should have entered World War I, or if we disagree, we shouldn't. I don't think that actually matters when you see that this can be used in the wrong hands. And also another thing they did was they did, they appealed to patriotic and nationalist sentiments. That's very similar to the way the media and people do today. So if you don't support the war, it's because you hate America and you want America to lose. And so, of course, that's not true, but they made it seem that way. And I think this just shows that obviously these tactics are still being used currently to this day. So what does this show you about the mindset of everyone involved? It shows you that, and first off, I want to say, the people who created this, Wilson and the guy George Creel and all the people involved in the running of the CPI, they truly believed they weren't doing anything wrong. All they were doing was just helping people see things the way they thought they should be seen. But, and, and really, what is the people? The people, they didn't react in a negative way, which is also very surprising to me that a group of people just watched the government create a committee on public information as an executive order, have it be reported on the front page of the New York Times, and no one really said anything. So I think overall, the lesson I want to take is the mindset that the people at the top totally think that they can totally trick you into thinking whatever they want you to think and the mindset of the people is that we're so willing and we're so ready to just have our government shape the world view that we have so i really wanted to talk about the cpi because 
I just thought it's something that I've been seeing everywhere in history books, and yet I didn't know too much about it, and I feel like a lot of other people didn't know too much about it. So that is the Committee on Public Information. If you like this kind of content, please make sure to like and subscribe. Thank you.